Okay, next up we have uh, Phil Jones from uh, Digital Science. Uh, when he first uh, mentioned uh, the potential name for his talk, and, and this uh, word the uh, Scientral Metrics came up was several months ago when I had to think to myself, what, what, what does that actually mean? And uh, when I did the search uh, a few months back, uh, I, I do recall that I had uh, come across it uh, previously, but uh, obviously uh, Phil will explain more details on inputs, outputs, and emergent properties, the new the new scientometrics, exactly. All right, so scientometrics is essentially the study of research outputs and research evaluations. Oh, if I could just find my mouse again, there we go. All right, so, yes, yeah, so as Graham noted in his introduction to the whole session, publishing really sits in the middle of a whole su scholarly supply chain that begins when somebody gets an idea in a, in a lab and writes a research grant and ends when the, the maximization of the impact of that idea has been achieved. So what I'm going to talk about really spans that entire arc. So bear that in mind as we start to make our way through it. So as a little bit of an introduction about me and about the company that I'm from and that I represent, really is almost as a disclaimer because I do have a little bit of a dog in this fight, uh, digital science was founded back in 2011, and we are a privately held company. We're not a non-for-profit, um, but we are entirely owned by a company called Holtzbrink Publishing Group. Now, if you haven't heard of digital science, you certainly haven't heard of Holtzbrink, I would imagine. Holtzbrink is probably best known as previously owning Nature Publishing Group. They now own just over 50% of the combined spring and nature. The fact that we are entirely privately owned and not publicly traded means that that frees us up to be a little bit more innovative, quite a lot more mission-driven. We don't have quarterly earnings reports, uh, quarterly earnings advice to shareholders. We're not entirely beholden to maximising profits on a quarterly basis. What we do do is we invest and incubate in startup companies that deliver services across that entire arc of the scholarly supply chain. This is a timeline of our investments um, over time, you may recognise some of these names on here. At least I hope you do, otherwise I need to have a word with our marketing department. So we have LabGuru here, which is a, uh, a, a, uh, a electronic lab notebook. Uh, if you're from Edinburgh University, you might be more familiar with R-Space. Yeah, think R-Space, but, uh, but it's a similar sort of thing to that. Um, Altmetric, uh, you're going to hear a little bit more about Altmetric from my colleague Jean later in the day. I hope you stick around for that. Um, hopefully you've heard of that and you've seen the donuts on publishers' websites. Uh, Figshare is our open data platform. We have ReadCube, which is a reading platform and reference manager. And then we've got some of the more uh, later stage stuff that we've done. Overleaf, collaborative writing. PeerWith is about um, recruiting people to help you with things like grammar and statistics and graphic design of your research outputs. And even things like uh, Transcriptic, which is our Internet of Things company. And, uh, and some patent data and things like that. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a concept. The evaluation gap. This one's been kicking around amongst scientometricians and bibliometricians for a while. And what the evaluation gap is, is the difference between the metrics and indicators that are currently available or have been traditionally available and, though, and the sorts of things that people who are interested in evaluating your research want to know. So have a little think, and perhaps I can see some hands up in a minute. Who might be interested, if you're an early career researcher, who might be interested in evaluating the quality of the research that you are doing? Got a hand up over here, who? Who might be interested in evaluating the quality of your research? Oh, uh, sorry, I misunderstood the question. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, supervisors, funders. Uh, so we've got supervisors, absolutely. Your supervisor wants to know whether you're doing a good job, obviously. Um, you've got funders. Very important point. Funders want to know whether you are delivering good value for their money. Who else would be interested, do you think? Idea of, not, not if you work in the industry. <laughs> Tenure panels. Tenure panels, exactly. Hiring promotion committees. Who else? Idea at the back? University. Your university, your institution, right? Your institution, your office of research management has strategic goals. They want to know who's helping them meet those strategic goals. What about the government? Governments, funders, policy organisations, all these people want to achieve something through research and they want to know whether you're contributing to that or not. So Paul Wooters, 
phrased this very well. He said, the fundamental gap between the dominant criteria in scientific quality control, which is peer review, and the impact factor and citations, and, on the other hand, the new roles of research in society. So how do we do that? How do we look broader than simply how many times somebody is citing an article? How do we look beyond the pure academic interest that's being demonstrated in an article and look at, how, and look at the entire uh, research landscape? Well, one thing that, you, oh, as I said before, you'll hear a little bit more about later is altmetrics. I won't go into too many details because I don't want to steal Gene's thunder. Um, altmetrics, basically, um, whether we're talking about altmetric.com or some of the other people in the space, Impact Story, Plum, uh, Plum X, Plum Analytics and all the rest of it, what that does is it adds to that citation stuff, it adds to that scholarly impact with, thing, with other types of mentions that are available typically on the web. Policy documents, uh, grey literature, um, social media even, and mainstream news. So any way in which research society is interacting with research will generally leave a footprint on the web that can be measured, and that can be used to assess uh, the impact, particularly downstream. What else can we look at for the entire research landscape? We can look at funding information. If you want to know as an institution uh, which are the growing areas of research, you can look at citations if you want. But maybe it would be better to look at who's being granted money to do particular types of research. If you think about it, the point from where somebody is originally given a grant being the first mention of, say, a new idea in research, that person is then going to have to do that research, publish that research, somebody else is going to have to read it, do some more research, and then cite it. It's two full cycles, which can be as long as eight years. So looking at awarded grant data gives you a much earlier signal about what's going on right now, not what has gone on a decade ago. What else, if you want to look at the whole thing, you can look at patents. Patents are not a measure of economic impact, but what they are is a measure of commercialization, which is potential economic impact down the line. So that is, a, that is another signal that we can look at. Putting this all together... This is the way that I like to think about it. This is, a, this is a graphic that I stole from a white paper that a colleague of mine, Simon Porter, wrote. And I really like the way that this represents what's going on here. So here, right at the one lab stage, the one researcher funder, you've got this initial sprout of an idea, which is just known to this one person as they write their one grant. As it turns into research outputs, it starts to spread and gather information. More and more people learn about it, people within the same lab, collaborators within the same institution. At some point, the research becomes mature, it goes out into the world, and it becomes published. Researchers at other institutions then start to hear about it. It starts to kind of span out. And at that point, it's picking up more information, more metadata. It becomes a publication. It gets a DOI. There are, there are data assets. There's open data associated with it. And then it travels into the big wide world, and it starts to have real impact, or non-scholarly impact. It not only gets cited, it starts to get picked up perhaps in the mainstream media. It starts to appear in policy documents. And again, more and more objects of information are attached to that single idea. So as it travels out through this landscape, it's picking up more information, more data, more metadata. It's becoming a bigger object in the world. <coughs> and just to kind of refer this back to the sort of thing that we're doing at Digital Science, we have uh, companies that work across this entire landscape. Uh, we have people, we have customers, we have clients, uh, we have people that we've hired out of various key stakeholders at this point. And so it's possible, um, it's possible to gather information, to gather data and form relationships across that entire landscape in order to build up a whole picture of everything that is going on across the entire scholarly supply chain. And at this point, I should say that other CRISP systems, altmetric and collaborative writing tools are available. So... How do you go about analysing research data? It's all very well to have all this big bucket of information if you can't make any sense out of it. Well, the first thing you have to do <coughs> is before you can analyse anything, you've got to classify it, you've got to characterise it, you've got to put this big bucket of information into little pots so that you can actually make sense and start drawing, uh, making analyses and start actually counting. So before you analyse it, you have to classify it. Now, when you, did your, when you chose your undergraduate courses, the way in which you decided what area of science to go into was disciplinary. So this is the old model of how research is broken down, right? Biology, molecular biology, biochemistry, 
plasma physics, atomic physics, solid state. Uh, there are all these different kind of disciplines which are looking at a, a fairly narrow range of phenomena or a fairly narrow range of techniques in order to essentially explore and expand on human understanding. That's all well and good. But the landscape has shifted now. Now with what they call the impact agenda, funders and, uh, and other interested parties and governments and, and society at large are interested in solving specific problems. So research has morphed, not entirely morphed, but it has expanded from a purely disciplinary uh, structure to one that has both disciplines and themes. So there is, for example, a Centre for Dementia Prevention at Edinburgh University. There are centres for climate change. There are schools for, um, I was going to say solar physics, but that's really a discipline. But you get the idea, right? There are problem-specific themes which are emerging, which are multidisciplinary. And there are some funders who talk about transdisciplinary research, which is the type of research that not only involves multiple disciplines, but also involves the individual stakeholders as well. So we're going, from an, we're going from an ivory tower model, if you like, where we're just studying one little narrow thing, to multiple people with multiple skill sets solving problems. That makes it more challenging to classify research. So what you have to do is you have to think about the question that you're trying to answer and build what's called a taxonomy. Now, if there are any information scientists in the room, you'll know what a taxonomy is. A taxonomy is a list of words that describes a discipline, a theme, a problem, however you want to cast it. You can create a list of words in order to describe it, in like a word cloud, if you like. You can then take that taxonomy and you can apply it to a search for citations, for metrics, for grants, for whatever it happens to be. You're basically branding and describing a theme or a discipline and then using that using that branding, using that description in order to measure it. There are several ways to do that. So the easiest way, and the way that a lot of people working in this field do it, is that they use an existing one. The most commonly, one is, the most commonly known one is MESH, Medical Subject Headings. MESH is great, it works very, very well, but to be honest, it's an easy problem. Because when you're talking about medical science, it doesn't really change. You know, oncology is oncology, and it's the same thing it's been for 50 years. Pediatrics is going to be about children in 100 years' time. Right? You don't have changes in the meanings of words in the way that you do in other disciplines. So mesh is quite easy, but the uh, mesh approach does not, necessarily, does not necessarily map across all of the kinds of questions that we're going to try to ask about research. There are other ontologies, like I said, taxonomies, like I say, but, it's, but they are not always suitable, and they're not complete, and we don't have descriptions of everything. So that's, that's one way you can look at it. Um, the other way is perhaps the, 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 the traditional way of forming these things is to consult with subject matter experts. Now, apologies, this was originally a, uh, a publisher presentation, so it says your editor's there, because if you were a publisher, you'd be, I'd be talking about your editors. But maybe at an institution, I'm talking about librarians, maybe I'm talking about researchers and faculty. You could imagine that any organisation has access to subject matter experts. Uh, when we're doing stuff internally, we have lists of people that we talk to about a particular subject. And we'll literally sit down and we'll say, you know, what are the keywords that describes computational social science? What are the keywords that describes whatever else, we were, whatever else we're thinking of? So the last way to do it is text mining. And this is something that we're doing a lot of work on at Digital Science at the minute. What you can do, just to kind of get a simplified sense of, of how you can kind of tackle these problems, is you can do things like a word frequency analysis. So let's imagine you have a corpus of literature and you want to know what, the, what the, the topics are, what the themes are, and you don't necessarily know what those themes are to begin with. So you're not going to lay out a list. You're going to create a list from the, from the words, from the big bag of words that you've got. What you do is you look for the frequency of those words and you compare the frequency of the words used in the documents to the frequencies of words used in similar documents about a different thing. That way, the technical words, the specific words that are to this subject matter, jump out, and you start to be able to cluster them, and you find the topics and ideas, and then the, uh, then the taxonomy emerges from the corpus of content. And once your taxonomy has emerged from your corpus of content, you can classify and cluster, and then you can start to measure. The other thing that you have to do is when you have existing data, 
you have to make sure that it's curated. Now, a project that we did um, over the past several years at Digital Science is called GRID, the Global Research Identifier Database. And what we did is we started with our, we actually started with our database of grants information. And we looked at every institution that was mentioned in a grant. We've since expanded it to other kinds of content. And we have hand curated a list of all of the institutions that we can find. What we then do is figure out the parent-child relationship between various types of institutions. The obvious example here, well, the example that I use here is, is Harvard. I could have used Edinburgh University, but I've used Harvard here. And you can see there are daughter institutions or, or child institutions within that, large, within that large overarching institution. So it understands those relationships, and that's about building the correct kind of data model in order to make sure that those relationships can always be mapped. Once you have the data all cleaned up, you can, of course, map to other things. Once you know what you're looking at, you can, in this example, you can look at the ISNI, the, you know, the Crossref data, so on and so forth. And even, interestingly, the most interesting part, about, for, for me anyway, visually, about the grid database is it gives geolocation information. So you can do geography-based maps and things like that, which is really interesting if you're starting with something that's, you know, let's say, just a, a poorly formatted you know, affiliations list, and then you end up with a, you know, with a, a global map of you know, whatever it is that you're looking at. So here are some ideas of things that you can do. Or here are ideas of things that we've done. So this is what we call the, the brain scan. This is something we did for, for HEFK, Higher Education Funding Council of England, um, which, which administers the REF, the Research Evaluation Framework. Now, is everybody familiar with the REF? We've got some heads nodding. Some heads nodding. Yeah, there are some people who probably aren't, right? If you're more earlier on in your career. So Britain has what's called, the UK has what's called a, a dual support system in academic funding, which not every country in the world does. But basically, your institution, the university, gets money through essentially two main streams. One of them is the competitive grants that your, you know, your supervisors are, are always writing, you know, something to the MRC and so forth, where they try and bring in money to do a specific project. The other one is through the block grant which HEFK basically decides how much money it's going to give to each institution. And one of the ways in which it makes that allocation is based on something called the Research Evaluation Framework, where your institution is required to create a report every several years, four or five years, something like that. Every several years, they're required to create a report which lays out how they are being impactful in society. And a lot of this talk about the evaluation gap and scientometrics and so forth in this country comes out of that conversation of how do, we, how do we demonstrate, how do we assess wider societal impact. So one of the things that we did for, for HEFK in helping them analyze this is a, is a map of different disciplines. And each of these is by mining research outputs and mining impact statements. And you can see that for a given institution here, uh, we have uh, nodes, the size of which indicates the, the strength of the research in that area, and connectors, which tell you about collaboration between each of these. So you could imagine if you are involved in research evaluation, whether you're an institution or a funder or a publisher or whoever you are, you can look at a visualisation like this and you can start to see clusters emerging of really strong collaboration over here in yellow, which is humanities. There's something going on over here. Let's have a look at that. Let's see what that's doing. Maybe this needs more funding and more space. You know, questions like that that you can answer. Now, this is a really interesting visualisation that we did for the same project. And this is based on a text mining of all of those impact statements across the entire, across the entire corpus. Now, just as a kind of little key to what's going on here, um, each impact statement is a little red dot. And the red ones are physical sciences, green ones are life sciences, yellow is humanities, and blue is social sciences. So there were four panels which did these assessments. And so each of these colours represents a different panel. And the clusters occur because what we did is we mapped the similarity between the language use between each impact statement. So if things are clustered together, that means there's a lot of similarity. If things are far apart, that means there's not much similarity. And what you can see are, and bear in mind, we didn't feed the algorithm any information about the structure of research in the UK. We can see clusters start to appear of different topics and themes. Now, the one, if I just have enough time down here, is really kind of cool. I'm just going to show you this. Now, can I get over here and look at this? This is magic. All right. 
I know, how clever. <laughs> right, so I can't really get it to go quite where I want, but there we go, this is close enough. All right, so this cluster down here, if I click on this, as you can see, it's lots of different mixed colours. And you can see that if I click around a little bit, I start to see the titles. What are they all about? They're all about environmental management of waterways. This wasn't something that, that necessarily anybody would have thought of before we did this analysis, because it's across different disciplines. You know, so it's not like we've got an awful lot of life sciences people doing it or an awful lot of physical sciences people doing it. But when you, when you look at, when you go into it with no assumptions and you let the computer do the numbers, you start to see things which you can then interpret intelligently after the fact. And this is, and this is a really exciting example of the sort of thing that we're able to do. And I believe with that, I am out of time. Yes, you are. Yes. Thank you, Phil. All right. Yeah, I don't particularly like the words interesting because it could mean anything. That was interesting, but that was interesting. <laughs> uh, time for maybe two minutes of questions. If anybody has any questions. I've stunned you all into silence. Look at that. Oh. Hi. Um, my thought is, who do you think benefits the most from this information derived? That's a big, complicated question, because it depends what you mean by benefits. So um, we, in the consultancy, we have clients across the entire spectrum. Okay, so um, actually most of our clients in the past have been funders and policy organizations. So we will talk to somebody like, somebody will work with us from one of the research councils, and they'll say, we have this major push towards this particular theme. Can you assess how effective it's being? But increasingly, we're talking to institutions who want to know about the sustainability of a particular theme or discipline. You know, do we want to build a huge building to support this area of research? Is it going to be funded still in five years' time? Or we might be approached by publishers who say, you know, we've got this corpus of, of, um, of, of literature that we're producing. What's really going on inside it? Are there... Are there journals here which have really got two things that are slightly overlapping and we need to have two journals? Or perhaps there are you know, two or three journals which are really publishing the same thing and we need to be consolidating. You know, where are our areas for growth? How do we reposition? Or is there anything that we're missing? You know, can we look at the open access corpus and say, oh, here are adjacent fields that you're completely missing because it's not in your scopes of any of your journals? So each of the different stakeholders can benefit enormously, but what this does do is it makes the whole system more efficient. So what benefits the most from being able to create these indicators and this you know, intelligent assessment of them is the progress of research increases. And that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to accelerate the progress of research by making each stakeholder's participation in it more efficient. Thank you. I think with that we'll move on to our next speaker, if we may.